Um, hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so yes, I did write this book uh, in 2016, um, and I wanted to mostly talk a bit about uh, the first half, mostly, um, which seemed most appropriate for understanding uh, history in Vancouver. Um, so I'll walk through um, some general ideas about, I think, where the house came from. But first, I want to start off by um, walking through uh, this dramatic transformation that we've seen in Vancouver. Um, looking back in 1961, we had you know, somewhere around three quarters of people living in single family detached houses. At least that's what they reported to the census. If you flash forward uh, 50 years, right, we have this dramatic period of change where we've gone down to somewhere around 33% of our structures being detached single family houses according to the census. So that's a really dramatic shift from three quarters to one third. Um, so that's a big part of the story that I want to sort of get to, is how did we accomplish this shift? To put it in perspective, right, if we compare down the coast to our sister cities uh, down in the United States, um, none of them are anywhere close in, in a comparative context, right? 2010 to 2011, uh, we've got uh, somewhere around a, just under half of the structures in San Francisco reported as single family detached houses. Once we get up to Portland, it's uh, almost two thirds, right? So Vancouver really is dramatic in the way that it's changed over the last 50 years. Comparing to other cities in the United States, right, we have some close contenders out on the East Coast, but of course they're cruising along on what is a lot of old housing stock. So New York, Philadelphia, even these really old cities in the United States, really big metropolitan areas, uh, still don't match Vancouver in terms of uh, the proportion of um, stock outside of single family detached housing. And then if we go to places like Phoenix, of course, Phoenix is really renowned for its sprawl. And we see the scope of Vancouver's change in part by comparison. If you look back in 1961, more of our structures were single family detached in Vancouver than is the case now in Phoenix. So again, huge transformation over the course of 50 years. Comparing to Canada, this is the only place in North America that we really get anywhere close, and that's Montreal, right? Again, a really old, old city, old metro metropolitan area that really has uh, um, a lot of old housing stock. And yes, Montreal in 2011 beat us just by a little bit in terms of the portion of its uh, housing stock that was outside single family detached. But Vancouver beats Toronto, it beats Quebec City, it beats, of course, Winnipeg, which is again up on the sprawling side in terms of a lot of single family detached houses. What's also striking about this transformation, of course, is that uh, it's been accompanied by this vision of Vancouver as an especially livable city. Now, of course, some of this comes from The Economist, and in particular, The Economist Intelligence Unit's rankings, and there are really good reasons to be skeptical of these rankings. One of which, of course, is they could not actually separate out Vancouver Island from Vancouver City when they actually were ranking. So the Malahat Highway and the traffic there caused a drop in our rankings one year. But you can nevertheless talk to people who live in Vancouver, and you still get some sense that uh, a lot of the people that live here really, really enjoy the city, right? So there really is this vision of livability. And this is just one of the people that I uh, quote that I talked to um, for the book itself. Um, talking about how much she loved her neighborhood, living in the West End and being able to walk everywhere, and uh, knowing her neighbors, knowing a lot of the people in the restaurants, et cetera. So you really get this sense that it really is a livable city in, in, uh, in a lot of different ways. So in this sense, I want to use this transformation as a backdrop. One, to talk about the, how did Vancouver transform away from the house. And two, to get some idea about how we got so many houses in the first place, which again, is where we start from, right? We start with, with more single family detached houses than Phoenix. To set that up, of course, we need to talk a little bit more about what is a house. Um, so I try to do this by breaking it down into four different forms of the house that we might want to think about, four different ways that it manifests itself. One is as a physical concrete structure, right? I mean, it's got walls, it's hard, um, we can feel it, we can smell it, we can hear it in terms of the creaking floorboards. There are ways that houses manifest themselves. It's also an idea, and there's some broad sense that everyone can talk about houses and know what you mean in some broad way. And I liken it in many cases to this Monopoly piece, right? This little, little plastic house. 
so people can talk about the house and think at least that they're conveying an idea of something to someone else. We also have the house as a market commodity, and of course, uh, we're not that familiar with the house as a market commodity here in Vancouver, but, uh, but people do sell these things. And when they sell them, they speak about houses as being for sale. Um, and they have separate them off from other kinds of structures that might be for sale. And then finally, we have the house as a regulatory creature. And this is the history that I'm most fascinated and excited by, is just getting some sense about how the house, the single family detached house, gets written into bylaws and comes to structure the city. To come back to these four forms, right, we actually have, we can go to Heidegger, we can go to existentialist thought, we can go to a lot of uh, interesting thinkers in terms of trying to get a sense of how people's dwellings and the way they understand and come to feel at home in their dwellings uh, operates and, and binds together their culture and their cultural ideas about how they want to live with the kinds of structures they build to house themselves. And we have this primordial sense, again, from thinkers like Heidegger, that this is how dwellings should be. People should build their own dwellings, and they should build them according to how they want to live. But of course, we don't have that much going on of that kind of housing today. Nevertheless, we do have some sense that people at one point in time did build their own kind of housing, and there was some cultural understanding of building housing according to how you wanted to live. We can go back to this in terms of pre-colonial housing. Uh, this is a quote straight out of uh, Simon Fraser as he's uh, coming down the river talking about the housing of, uh, of the people living along the, what would later become to be known as the Fraser River. He talks about how their houses are built of cedar planks, similar in shape to the ones he's already described. The whole range is 60 to 140 feet long by 60 broad under one roof. The front is 18 feet high and the covering is slanting. All the apartments, which are separated in portions, are square, excepting the teeth, which is 90 feet long. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, this sounds like a low-rise apartment building, right? So this is actually the first form, these kind of old longhouses are the first form of housing that we really see mentioned in terms of Vancouver's history. Later on, we still did have some of this self-built housing, and you can still see it today, right? These are some of the squatter shacks on Dead Men's Island in the Stanley Park in the 1900s. Uh, by the way, of course, borrowed from Vancouver archives, which I'm, I'm borrowing a lot of their pictures uh, for this evening. Um, but uh, we can see that people were still squatting. They still did do some self-building in Vancouver through the years. More uh, shacks along the Georgia Viaduct um, up to 1930. So again, self-built shacks. You will still see people building shacks. Um, there was recently a story of someone who built a shack down along uh, the Fraser River again, uh, only to eventually be evicted. Um, but people are still self-building, and you still see this in a number of people's uh, um, structures around Vancouver. At the same time, most people now are uh, having houses built for them. So we have a, quite a development industry here, um, and of course this industry is responding to a regulatory structure that they're operating within. As Carl Polanyi would put it, regulation and markets grew up together. So part of what I'm interested in in trying to figure out where the house comes from, especially in a single family detached regulatory form, is trying to get a sense of how it relates to the early ways that the city gets settled. In terms of colonizing and commodifying Vancouver, uh, we of course moved from these Coast Salish communities, the Musqueam, Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, communities um, to the establishment of the Hudson Bay Trading Post, um, and then ultimately to a royally formalized colonization of unceded lands. And this is when basically the, uh, um, the queen exerts her authority over the land and says, this is mine now, without actually negotiating this ahead of time. Now, as this is done, what's really neat about, again, some of these old maps within the Vancouver archives is you can see how the lines are drawn out and laid out into lots for sale. And of course now all sales, once the uh, uh, royal uh, assertion of ownership is made, have to go through the royal col colonial authority. The sales proceed. We see here again a uh, um, provincial government land auction of a lot of these lots that have been carved up around Vancouver. And uh, um, of course, eventually people start to move in. We have the broad settlement of what becomes Vancouver, which is speeded up, of course, once the railroad arrives 
and transforms the Granville town site into Vancouver. So Vancouver becomes this boom town, right? From its incorporation uh, in 1886, um, especially with the arrival of the railroad, it becomes this boom town. Within, within 25 years, it grows to Canada's third largest metropolis. Now this is, by and large, market-led growth. And uh, it is what a lot of sociologists come to think of as a growth machine. The people who started Vancouver, who went through the incorporation, were very much invested in heavy growth. And you can go back to the documents of the time and people wanted growth, 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 growth. Right? That's what they really wanted to do, is bring more and more people out in terms of the, uh, the leaders of the city, and certainly the real estate industry of the time. This, of course, is just a picture of the clearing of uh, the brush. Lots of these fires uh, that were used to clear away the brush in the early days are also, of course, what led to Vancouver's Great Fire. Immediately after Vancouver's Great Fire, of course, we get Vancouver's first fire bylaw, which is also the first uh, bylaw that really starts to regulate structures in the city. In the meantime, though, we can think about these lots, right? We've sold off these lots, they're getting smaller. Inside these lots, they're also being subdivided and being used um, to build houses and uh, to set up different kind of commercial shops. This is a fire insurance map from 1889. I discovered this today, so I was very excited to actually see this. Um, and I'm going to use it to illustrate some of how these different uh, um, uses developed in such a way that would also often be problematic for people. Here I'm just identifying what is, if you look at the uh, actual written uh, uh, map here, you'll see lots of things written as DWG, that stands for dwelling. Here's a dwelling. I'm going to highlight the one in blue because I just want you to imagine for a moment that you have just built a house here on this lot you've purchased. Now, as you purchase this, of course, you're surrounded by other dwellings, right? And there's a nice Presbyterian church up top in the corner, and market-led growth, all these other lots are being bought and slowly developed around you. Now, this particular arrangement doesn't seem too bad. Again, you're close to a church, you're close to other dwellings, you've got a cobbler down the street. This is a pretty nice place to live. The other things that start to develop around you with this rapid market-led growth, though, um, start to really challenge your own livability. And this is where we see your neighbors subdivide their dwelling, um, and now you're not living next to one family, but multiple families. You see tenements start to show up in the back lots of your neighbors as well. And uh, these tenements, of course, fill your neighborhood with even more people. And what's worse, of course, they're poor people. We have uh, the Glasgow Hotel and Saloon open up next door to you, right? So we've added noise. Uh, we're having more dwellings next to them. We have a soap factory come on in the back there, right? Uh, now you're getting the smell of soap, and I don't know about you, but whenever I walk by a soap store, even I'm just assaulted with, with the smell of soap. Um, the lumber bill isn't far away. You have smoke billowing up. Right? We have new tenements being built far uh, uh, nearby. We have, and this speaks to the historical discrimination in the city, a Chinese churches identified, a Chinese laundry identified. This is the nascent Chinatown that begins to develop in Vancouver, recorded here in 1889. Right? So we have a lot of things that someone who's bought this house, this, this dwelling, and set it up uh, in this early 1889 era, um, suddenly finds themselves surrounded by a lot of neighbors they might think of as objectionable. Now this is what happens under this market governance in terms of how these lots get used and um, uses spring up. We can see this again just directly in terms of looking at some of the old streetscapes. Here's a real estate office, of course, surrounded by, again, uh, um, uh, some multi-level housing on one side and a tobacco store on the other. We have these kind of mixed uses all over Vancouver in its early days. And of course, Falls Creek itself is becoming really heavily industrialized. So this too is a big part of early Vancouver history. So these uh, boomtown problems are actually relatively widespread. So a lot of North American, in particular, cities are being governed under market principles at their founding, especially as you move more and more to the West. Because this is the time when a sort of what we would now think of as neoliberal governments, an, an, an idea that markets are how we should uh, govern, 
is really an ascendance during this late 19th century era. So there's a lot of problems that are associated with the management of this rapid market-led growth. One, and central for uh, this imagined person who has purchased this dwelling, is a middle-class privacy and propriety. And the middle class, the urban middle class, is developing at this time in the late 19th century um, in a way that it hasn't in the past. And as it's developing, right, through this Victorian era, it is gathering these new needs. A need for privacy, a privacy is first articulated um, as a right uh, during this era. Uh, we also have this real concern with propriety, right? And there are several authors um, who think of the middle class of this era as needing a stage to enact their moral worth upon and a sanctuary to really protect themselves and protect their privacy from what's going on around them. So these are things that people who have studied the, the history of the middle class have, have seen in terms of uh, the demands being made at this time for what the middle class needs. Uh, we also have these boom and bust markets uh, and real estate goes through periods of rap rapid oscillation where uh, prices rise in dramatic fashion only to crash and then rise and crash again. So even people who own property are concerned, um, and even people who are real estate, in the real estate industry are really concerned about what the market is doing. And we have real concerns about smell and that are increasingly being connected to public health uh, in new ways that uh, are also leading to real reform. We have a reform era that responds to this rapid market-led growth. And uh, proliferation of nuisances are uh, um, something that is also on the minds of a lot of urban reformers in the era. How do we deal with all of the problems created by this rapid urban growth? Some of the ways that uh, early Vancouver deals with this is through uh, permits, through permitting systems, and through um, also uh, basically minimum distances that new uses have to be. So a tannery, for instance, it smells, it's terrible. It has to be a minimum distance from a residence or use in order to come into, uh, in to come into place, in order to operate. At the same time, as they start to develop these uh, reactive regulations, these uh, permitting structures, these minimum distances, they become increasingly unwieldy to operate. So even the inspectors, even the different um, regulatory regimes that the city puts in place in reaction to these urban nuisances become unwieldy in their own right and become more and more difficult to manage and create new problems as a result. One other response, aside from this kind of really quick reactive one-off um, regulations, is to move away. And of course, the elites do this in one of the biggest uh, early migrations. They move to the West End. And so this becomes an early way for the elites to get away from all the problems caused by uh, this market-led growth. But of course, as they move to the West End, they introduce more market growth principles there. People increasingly subdivide their mansions and start renting them out. And so we have another elite migration to get away from all the new problems created in the West End. And they move out to Shaughnessy and to Point Grey in particular. As these elite enclaves settle down in uh, um, Shaughnessy and Point Grey, following what urban sociologists at the time thought of as patterns of urban succession, that is, ways that the city grows outward, and the elites move farther and farther away from that growth to get away from all the problems caused by the city. As they do this, once they settle in Shaughnessy, which of course is created and developed um, by the railroad itself, has friends in high places, they pass a provincial act that limits Shaughnessy to single family uh, use. Right? So we have actual provincial code that starts to regulate the use of land in Shaughnessy. And here's the first place we start to see single family dwellings become encoded in law. Point Grey does this as well through its own bylaw, its municipal bylaw. They protect themselves for single family use in 1922. This is the first time we see a municipal bylaw that actually puts forward the protection of single family detached as a particular land use. Arguably the first time we actually see zoning in Canada. Now the municipal zoning solution, where does it come from? This kind of idea that we can set aside and protect land use for single family dwellings alone, well, it comes in part from the Garden Cities movement, um, which is developing in England at the time. The town planning institutes being promoted by Thomas Adams, a major planning figure who's spreading 
uh, the Garden City idea um, across North America as well as outside of, um, outside of the United Kingdom. We also had the Vancouver Planning Commission set up in 1922 trying to figure out uh, how Vancouver is going to grow. Uh, they're increasingly interested in this nascent planning profession that is developing, again, under the guidance of people like Thomas Adams. We have provincial enabling legislation that says, yeah, yeah, we should do this in 1925. Ultimately, Thomas Adams proves a little too controversial, a little bit too, shall we say, socialist for uh, Vancouver's founders, so they bring in the American Harwin Bartholomew to actually uh, plan uh, for Vancouver. And of course, you can see lots of Bartholomew's documents out here around uh, in the Vancouver Museum, the Museum of Vancouver. Um, and then they, of course, have lots of input by the commission, uh, by the ratepayers uh, associations um, as they're trying to develop this plan. And they're integrating Vancouver with Point Grey and South Vancouver at the time, bringing together these three separate municipalities. Why did I throw an American Supreme Court justice up there? Well, Louis Brandeis was the one who argued for the right to privacy in the late, uh, late 19th century. And he's also one of the voices in a very narrow decision that creates the Euclid decision in the, in, uh, the United States the Euclid decision, which actually says you can do this use-based zoning that protects single-family residential, and that's legal. It was a test that was very, very narrowly decided. Um, and, and this is why the way we see cities all across North America today setting aside so much land for the single-family detached house, um, it could have gone the other way. It was really, really close. Um, but it's legislated, it's protected in law, it passes its major legal test in the United States, and that helps it spread all across Canada as well. So zoning for houses, it becomes a solution to the middle class urban woes, it protects the single family detached house, and it installs it as, as this uh, relatively well-defined regulatory creature um, that we see now set up um, eventually all across America and uh, Canada. But to do this, we have to define it. We have to actually get some kind of definition. You can see what these definitions look like today by going to Vancouver's bylaws. They're still on the books. How do we define single family? Well, now, at least, family is defined as one or more individuals all related to one another by blood, marriage, or adoption or a maximum of three unrelated individuals living together as a household. So this is still on the books, it's still a code. Um, we have a special exceptions made for living together in a common law relationship. Uh, we have, uh, again, this sort of sop to the concern that maybe we shouldn't allow municipalities to define families, which is this addition to say that, okay, well, three unrelated people, that also could be a family. But you have uh, uh, municipalities effectively de defining something that uh, other courts are really concerned about giving them the power to do, which is why they get challenged on this. And they say, OK, any three individuals, that's fine. Once we get a family definition, though, we've separated out a family who can live in a one family uh, dwelling. Then we can actually also separate out the dwelling side. And we can say, OK, this is who can live in this dwelling. Right? But we have to define these things. Otherwise, all these practices that the middle class found really troubling boarding, lodging, um, subdivision of, of dwellings. We have to find a way to stop this. So they do this by first defining family and then defining the dwelling unit itself, right? And the dwelling unit uh, basically sets out around the kitchen. That's the one thing that we can control here that we can say there's a maximum of one kitchen within a dwelling unit. Because of course, as soon as you start adding more kitchens, you can do that subdivision that they want so desperately to stop in terms of setting up a single family detached house. So maximum of one kitchen, everything else is a minimum. But you have a maximum of one kitchen, um, minimum of one complete bathroom unit is what we have now. Um, all rooms of the dwelling unit shall remain accessible from within that dwelling unit, again, preventing subdivision, which is what they're trying to do. And then the now Airbnb challenging part, no person shall use or permit to be used any dwelling unit for a period of less than one month, unless the unit forms part of a hotel or is used for a bed and breakfast accommodation. It is notable, of course, that in this early age, 
hotels and apartment buildings were not actually neatly defined as separate from one another. And they were thought of as commercial uses of land as opposed to these residential uses of land, which is what are being protected through these new zoning codes. As we start to define single family detached houses in law, we also start to define them in terms of census definitions, and we can start counting them. Until we actually define them in law, though, we don't even have a good count of how many of these things are out there. But you see them start to show up and define the ways in the census in both Canada and the United States after we get these bylaws start to be passed. And they spread really quick to municipalities all across both countries. So as we get this zoning bylaw set up, we also reserve a lot of land for single family detached houses. Of course, this is uh, uh, the initial interim zoning bylaw passed uh, with the Great House Reserve. All of these uh, lands set aside as reserve for single family detached houses colored in pink. So we actually see that most of the lands of early Vancouver, especially outside of what was formerly the municipal boundaries of Vancouver, so moving into South Vancouver and Point Grey, uh, most of those lands are reserved for single family detached houses and nothing else is supposed to be put in there. So this creates a real fix for this problem of, uh, this, uh, uh, of the middle classes, um, also problems with public health, problems that lots of people were wrestling with and trying to come up with solutions for. Um, they solve all these problems of the market-driven chaos of the city by setting up this great house reserve. This preserves livability for those people who live in houses, and on purpose, it keeps out the poor, right? Because that's not uh, who these houses are for. And those are the kinds of folks that are imagined to challenge livability. Now, of course, in Vancouver, it keeps out everybody except millionaires. So that's the transformation that we've seen in recent years as prices have gone above a million dollars for all houses. So coming back to this, though, we've got this great house reserve. We can take us up now to uh, 1961, and we can see how it gets filled in. Right? It is the case that these bylaws that are set in place um, early on with, uh, with zoning in uh, uh, Vancouver are actually set aside temporarily through the Depression, through World War II, and the post-war era, they become enforced uh, wholeheartedly again. And we see a lot of uh, shoving of secondary suites out of uh, exclusive neighborhoods and a return to single family uh, dwelling character. So you see them really fill out these neighborhoods that are set aside as protected um, under zoning codes for single family dwellings, you see them start to fill out with single family dwellings in such a way that by 1961, pretty much everything outside of that old urban core in Vancouver gets filled out by single family dwellings. And where are we today? Well, despite the fact that, as I've already mentioned, Vancouver has transformed itself away from single family detached houses in terms of where most people live, and how its dwelling stock has transformed, most of that zoning is still in place. Most of this great house reserve that was set up is still there, and still there in pink uh, on this map today. Now, I won't go too far into it, but uh, um, it's worth noting that there are a lot of problems associated with promotion of single family detached houses as the way that everyone should live which is what was done effectively through setting aside so much land for single-family detached houses. One, of course, is the affordability issue, right? As single-family detached houses have moved above the $1 million mark, of course, they've become a really unaffordable way of living, right? So they've moved out of the reach of most people in terms of housing. Sustainability, right? In terms of uh, um, single-family uh, dwellings, of course, they use up a lot more land than other forms of dwellings. Uh, this if you are to rely upon single family detached houses, ends up pushing um, cities further and further out uh, and eating up more and more land per person overall. Um, so in terms of displacing surrounding um, uh, ecosystems, single family detached dwellings become a disaster. At the same time, single family detached dwellings also uh, have effects in terms of their own energy use. They are less energy efficient than other forms of dwelling. Um, this, of course, has to do with the fact that you're not sharing walls, and they tend to be bigger than other forms of dwelling. Um, and they also tend to encourage automobile use, 
in such a way that more and more people are driving when you're relying upon single family detached dwellings um, as the primary way that you're housing people. So in terms of sustainability, both of these things lead to more greenhouse gas emissions and ultimately end up displacing um, ecosystems not just in the surrounding area of a city, but globally. And that's, again, a big problem with the broader reasons that houses are seen as less sustainable than other forms of dwelling. We also, of course, have a lot of urbanists who become very, very concerned about single-family detached houses. Uh, this has a long history in terms of criticism within uh, um, people who are invested in cities of being concerned about the vitality of our urban spaces. Single family detached houses are seen by a lot of thinkers as really eroding that vitality of urban spaces, especially to the extent that we zone for these things so that you have houses surrounded by other houses and create kind of dead scapes that are dotted with um, automobile intensive commercial centers, strip malls effectively. Right? So this is a real concern for a lot of people interested in actual cities and the spaces that cities provide in the sorts of urban vitality that cities provide, in the ballet that cities provide, in the words of Jane Jacobs. Um, so this is a, another real challenge, another real problem associated with relying so much on single family detached houses as a way of housing people. Broadly speaking, democracy is also, there's a lot of thinkers who are really interested in how um, Living in single family detached houses creates more homogenizing environments where people are surrounded by other people like them and don't come to encounter differences often. And this creates a real problem for empathy. Um, it creates real um, problems for uh, a broader body politic in terms of getting um, people talking to one another. Um, it's just a quick aside, but if you run the regression at the state level comparing uh, how many people live in uh, single family detached houses to what the vote for Donald Trump was, it's strongly correlated. Right? So that's just one uh, more a little piece of evidence to add to the broader problems that we might understand of how living in houses, in terms of too many people doing it, tends to erode democratic. And then finally, we've got uh, a lot of people who are interested in saying that you know, detached houses are bad for our health, right? Especially insofar as they erode walkability, they um, deter people from getting outside and walking to the store, walking to uh, um, their other sort of amenities in their neighborhood. That's a problem, because we want to encourage people to do that if we want to have their health um, persist. So for all these reasons, we can think of the house as being potentially a problem. And if we do, then of course, Vancouver becomes the success story. So how do we come back to Vancouver's dramatic transformation here? How did it actually change and move so far away from a single family detached house in terms of uh, how people are living? Well, it did a few things. I think of these as building around the Great House Reserve, building over the Great House Reserve, and renovating the reserve itself. So we can think of Vancouver as doing all of these things. When I'm thinking about building around the Great House Reserve, um, what I'm thinking of is making use of this land that has not been set aside through, in the context of the city of Vancouver, RS zoning, right? Residential single family zoning. So how do they make use of this land in Vancouver? Well, one of the things they do, and of course one of the things they're most celebrated uh, for doing in Vancouver is keeping out uses like the freeway that really take up lots of urban land and make urban life less livable. So by stopping the freeway in the context of Vancouver, we've also obviously made it harder to get in from the suburbs where people might be living in single family detached houses more often, but we've also preserved a lot of urban space in that urban core that would otherwise have gone to roadways. Roads take up a massive amount of our urban land base. So Getting rid of that freeway and not having it come all the way into Vancouver meant we had all this extra land we could do other stuff with. And it also meant it was a more pleasant place to be. Vancouver's also worked to densify its urban core in what a lot of people think of as livable ways. Right? Now it's gone back and forth on how it's done this in terms of uh, high rises, low rises, um, setting up the kinds of new innovations in, in living that we see with things like cooperatives. Um, there's been a lot of interesting things going on in Vancouver's urban core. And there's also been the redevelopment, of course, of a lot of these former industrial lands, False Creek being the prime example of that, 
what used to be this heavily industrial um, uh, landscape has been transformed into a heavily residential and pleasant landscape uh, around Falls Creek. The other big thing that Vancouver has done, of course, building outside of this uh, single family detached uh, great house reserve is it set up this agricultural reserve, protecting the wildlands and the agricultural lands from the further encroachments of suburban sprawl. In terms of building around the single family house then, we've invested in these urban cores. This is from the Livable Region Plan from 1975. You see some of these urban cores already identified. Um, these have been densified. Other urban cores were added. Of course, they, no one ever expected Richmond would become as big as it has. Um, and we see that that intensification though has produced a lot of kinds of dwellings that aren't single family detached houses. The other thing, and here's where, that, uh, where we see that agricultural land reserve and what effectively becomes an urban containment boundary around the metropolitan area um, of Vancouver. This has set aside all these lands um, in more or less solid ways from development by single family detached houses. So it's protected the agricultural land and the crown lands up into the mountains from being developed. So we built around the Great House Reserve. How much have we actually built over the Great House Reserve? Well, as one planner likes to put it, um, a diamond is forever, a single family detached neighborhood, and near, very nearly so. These things protect themselves, right? So here we see the 1930s Vancouver zoning map. Here's the current Vancouver zoning map. There have been some small uh, ways that this, for, this land set aside as single family detached has been brought back into an urban core use, either turned into commercial use or made more likely a multifamily uh, use. But it's really limited. It's mostly along the arterials. Um, and there's a couple of other spots where things like uh, BC Women's uh, and Children's Hospital have been added right, to a single family neighborhood. So we haven't done a great deal of transformation away from what have been long-standing, very heavily protected neighborhoods, protected through the single family zoning um, that we see. That, of course, the pace of that is increasing, uh, just to lay that out. So what's the other thing that Vancouver has done? We've built around, we've built over in the small bits, and we've also uh, altered the fundamental character of single family detached neighborhoods. And in this sense, uh, we've changed uh, RS from being a single family to single family with secondary suites and laneway houses, right? Which of course means you can get three families on a single family lot. So this too is a big transformation. And this was kind of the sneakiest transformation that Vancouver did in terms of moving away from the single family um, zoning. Mutate the creature itself, so to speak. Of course, the preeminent example of this tends to be our Vancouver specials, um, which were built uh, with the idea that you could easily separate these things and create two uh, different dwellings in mind. They were also, of course, built to maximize the floor space overall you can get on a lot. But it's our own uh, uh, local form of architecture that we should celebrate. So these are the ways, building over, building uh, around, and renovating the very meaning of single family that Vancouver has managed this dramatic transformation away from uh, single family detached house dominance. And it's why Vancouver has moved so far relative to all these other um, metropolitan areas. Just to give you the update, here's the 2016 data. Here I'm shifting to where people are actually living too, right? So what proportion of residents live in these different types of dwellings. But you can see here, we can see these uh, uh, exact three ways that uh, Vancouver has gone about moving away from the single family detached house um, uh, emphasized. And in part, it's helpful to compare it to the other uh, major metropolitan areas we see here. Of course, most of Canada is still living in single family detached dwellings. If you go to Montreal, we've now beat Montreal. By 2016, we've surpassed Montreal in terms of our uh, uh, moving away from single family detached houses. But you can see Montreal is primarily a low-rise apartment building landscape. Right? And that speaks to this old stock. They've got a lot of old housing that has been subdivided into low-rise uh, housing. Um, compare that to Toronto. 
which uh, isn't quite at the same level as Montreal in terms of moving away from the detached house. But what Toronto has done, of course, is really heavily invest in high rises. And that's the little green bar at the top there. And you see lots and lots of people living in high rises. Vancouver, on the other hand, has this mix of low rise and high rise and all the darker blue there. Those are different ways that single family detached houses have, in many respects, been subdivided and um, renovated to create multiple dwellings within these things, right? So this is a strategy that Vancouver has pursued heavily in terms of moving away from the single family detached house. So the remaining question, um, and this is to some extent a question I'll leave you with, is, is this unfinished work, right? Do we still want to do some major um, transformations to continue moving away from the single family detached house in Vancouver? What challenges remain if we want to do this? Well, one, of course, that many people still want houses. Um, and it's understandable, right? This is how a lot of people grew up. This is uh, uh, what people think of as the appropriate housing for a family in many cases. Uh, so a lot of people still really want this. Um, there's also real neighborhood resistance to, sing, uh, to, uh, to actually intruding into these single family detached neighborhoods, right? And we can see this, of course, in a lot of activities uh, directed against uh, redevelopment. At the same time, there is increasing flexibility and adaptability. A lot of young families are actually quite keen to try different ways of living. And even if they're not keen to do it, they're willing to try it. Um, and we also see this possibility that Vancouver could become this model of livable density. Right? That in some respects, is unique in North America. Again, we are now moved the furthest away from single family detached house dominance of any major metropolitan area. So could we become this model um, that would fit with our greenest city rhetoric and, and move us forward um, to show the way for other possible metropolitan uh, models? So that's all that I have for you. Um, thank you for, uh, again, having me here. I've got uh, lots of ways to contact me. And also, um, again, there are these flyers in case you're interested in the book. There's a discount uh, attached to the flyer in terms of the person who's sitting in the back. Um, but I'm totally happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have for me.